Hello friends from around the world. Today is our third episode of Visi Misi Podcast. Here we have Ryan D'Souza as our guest. He is an analyst previously in Scrum Ventures, a US-based generalist venture capital. He is here to talk with us about how he got to VC, his future aspirations, and also why he thinks that venture capital is a feasible career opportunity for all of you. So, Ryan D, thank you for coming today. And first of all, we've met through Scrum Ventures. So we are actually working together for the past six months. And it's been a very enjoyable working process, I would say, with you. Because you've trained me, you've made me who I am today. You've told me a lot of stuff that I don't think I knew beforehand. And also for the listeners, right? So... The first time we talked was because I wanted to join the firm that Ryan D was in. So Ryan D has been in Scrum for one year at a time. And then I started to try to find a place to do my internship. And then at the time, I contacted Ryan D to kind of like understand why he joined Scrum Ventures at the time. And then he mentioned something about wanting to extend for another six months. So that kind of like hooked me in. So yeah, please feel free to introduce yourself, why you joined NUS Overseas College, an entrepreneurship program by NUS, and also why join Scrum. And lastly, why another six months? Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Hans. Yeah, and it was a pleasure working with you for like six months in Scrum and seeing like how much you grew from our initial call that you had, just wanting to learn about a VC role over like joining a startup and then joining the team and then seeing how you just work through everything, the deal sourcing all the way to the diligence process. So the first question about why I joined NUS Overseas College. So maybe I'll start by sharing a bit of my background before like the NOC program. So previously before NOC program, I've worked at two other startups before. So I was a brand ambassador for Grab, focusing on like driver acquisition previously before I joined uni. And then I joined, I was at Shopee doing business development. And I was also launched my own e-commerce brand previously, as well as uh, managed my own uh, B2B cleaning company for about a year and a half. So all this, I did it while still in school. And one thing that really attracted me for the NOC program is I was just, I was always reading up on like how companies are raising mega rounds in the US, you know, back then it was Uber and WeWork. And I was just fascinated with like the space, not only the startup space, but these like legendary founders and also the the people behind them, so like Masayoshi-san and all these visionaries in some sense, these venture capitalists. So I told myself, you know what, I want to go there and see it for myself. And I kind of, in a naive way, I kind of envisioned myself walking along the streets of San Francisco and then meeting up with Jack Dorsey or maybe Elon Musk getting off his desk line and ha- ha- having the ability to snap a photo and ask for like maybe a few life advice. So that was my main motivation at the start. But also along the way, during my, as I was going through like school, clearing the modules and like preparing for the uh, NOC program, I realized the main reason why I want to join NOC is because my previous ventures that I worked on, like be an e-commerce business or my cleaning company, they weren't scalable. And I wanted to, I wanted to actually build something that was scalable in the long term. And I realized like one of the ways to do that is by building a tech company. So uh, that led me to like, to apply for like the NUS overseas college. And then I went for it. And why did I choose to join like a VC firm over a startup? So when I was looking at both a VC and a startup, uh, I guess both has its pros and cons. For a startup, you get to see the product to market. So how do you uh, launch a product? And then you see things from like a product out. Whereas from a VC point of view, you see it from the market in. So you see like what what is lacking in the market. And then you try to see if the product that these uh, startups are building, w- will there be a like, potential for it? And is there a space for like innovation and are they solving a real problem? So that was one of my main dilemma. You know, my goal has always been like to build a tech company. So back then I didn't know what company I was going to start. And I just want to build something that was uh, scalable. And I had to ask myself, you know, the odds of succeeding in a startup, it's like what, 5, 10%. So how do you improve that odds for yourself, especially you're in school? So I, and I told, and I was looking at the two options and I, and the reason why I joined the VC is because I felt it's crucial at an early stage to kind of um, understand the playbook of startup. And when I talk about playbook, of course, no company actually like goes through the same path, but throughout like one and a half years in a VC fund, I realized that there are some stuff that successful startups always do. And I, for example, like build, measure, learn. 
So the successful startups know how to iterate quickly and they know how to, when to abandon a particular product and when to pivot slightly. And they know how to find their target customer segment. And I guess that's something you can learn in a startup as well. But when you learn it from like a startup, it's just, I would say it's more focused and specialized. So I wanted to go a VC fund, understand the whole dynamics of venture capital and also the kind of, I mean, the startup playbook in that sense. And also before I even joined a VC fund, venture capital to me was just like this huge billion dollar industry that's hidden behind this curtain. And I thought, you know, since there's this opportunity given to me by NUS and I want to take a peek into that this like mysterious world that is actually financing all the innovation. And if you think about it, venture capital is just a group of, a small group of individuals with their own contrarian viewpoint of the future and they are just deploying capital to whatever they feel is the future of the world, you know. There are VCs today who think the future of food will be plant-based. And that's where they are pouring all their money in. And similarly, we see like there are, there are VCs who feel like the future would be space travel. And then you see all these space companies like being launched. So yeah, I think that's what uh, attracted me. And to the last question, of why did I choose to extend for another six months? So one of the goal of KPI that I set for myself when I was in the VC fund was to actually source for a company all the way uh, from like my initial call with them to a partner call and to invest in a company to be a portfolio company. I feel like that is one way I can really say like I've I've done like the the rite of passage of a VC analyst. And so my internship was kind of unique because I had to work remotely. So I actually did like Pacific time from like 12 midnight Singapore time all day to 10 a.m. for about a year. And also because it happened during like the Black Swan event. So we stopped investment for about like three months to focus on portfolio support. So I didn't really get like that kind of head start to source for companies. So I was close to sourcing for a few companies and investing in them towards the end of my time in like or end of my internship in December. And then I told myself, but then again, the company, you know, for various reasons, we did not invest in it. So I told myself, you know, I want to give myself six more months before I graduate to kind of like try it, go for it again. But yeah, I mean, in venture capital, as with many things, you kind of need luck. And yeah, I guess my luck ran out and my time was up. So I didn't manage to pull it through. But yeah, I definitely enjoy my time. And I, I enjoyed all the... Uh, that's so far. Thank you very much for your introduction, by the way, about yourself. And sure. I think I can relate so much about how you wanted to have that kind of like end-to-end -end experience of sourcing a startup up until it's being invested. That's kind of my goal there as well then again that's correct like at the end of the day luck is there and then also the fitness of a particular company to our firm and to be honest like i'm not quite sure what's black swan and also what happened why do you work remotely i mean perhaps you want to share more about uh, your first yeah sure so I actually went over to San Francisco in like January 2020 to um, work for the Oscar Ventures. So I was based there for about like three months. So during my time there, one of, I, I mentioned like I had this like uh, dream of like meeting these tech uh, billionaires on the street. So one thing I did was like, I think every week I would join like two to three events, be it startup events or even like random events. Like maybe like one of the most random ones I joined was this like, voice UX. So they talk about how do you design how like the best like user experience for like these kind of voice application. And voice application in the sense like these apps that you launch on like Alexa or Google Home. So yeah, I, I did meet like many oh, interesting, interesting people along the way and I went for like startup demo days. And you know, the funny thing was in the Bay Area, I would say anyone is anyone you pick off the street could potentially be a somebody somewhere and you you just don't know. So a case in mine was I was at this, my first ever event at UC Berkeley. So it was the uh, Skydeck, UC Berkeley uh, Skydeck demo day. And I was, I was just looking around for startups. And then I saw this guy who, he seemed a little lost. He was just standing around. And then I actually like reached out to him. But actually he wasn't lost. He turned out to be a partner in one of the largest like early stage fund uh -huh. in uh, San Francisco. So yeah, I managed to like get his contact. And I actually reached out when we wanted to invest in another remote working company, which is uh, was his portfolio company but unfortunately like they closed out the round yeah and yeah it was interesting and for the black swan event so when covid hit i was actually the school actually asked me to come back to singapore to work remotely for the team so uh -huh. of course uh, working remotely was not something that was granted so i had to speak with the team and i was glad like the team at scrum ventures were understanding 
and they actually like valued my my contributions to the team and were happy to have me like continue remotely. So the, the reason why I mentioned this Black Swan event was because of this Black Swan memo launched by Sakura Capital. On the, and that was, I think, on 29th of March. It was the day whereby the stock market crashed. Sakura said, like, um, startups sh- should actually cut costs. They should focus on profitability. They should uh, manage their burn very well. And I mean, fast forward a year later, and we see we still see these mega rounds and how quickly the things have, like, actually changed. So, but then again, during that period, you know, for the first uh, couple of months of COVID, VCs were especially cautious, so Scrum Ventures included. And I spent a lot of time working closely with portfolio companies to help them with whatever help and, uh, they may require during this period, including like transition into like remote work. So one thing I worked for them was actually created like a virtual sales deck. I mean, and I'm not a salesperson myself like previously. So, and also I'm new to this virtual or vi- remote voice, remote conferencing. So. What, one thing I did was to research on like how to best present and sell online. And I actually shared with like over, I think, 70 of our portfolio companies and like created like Slack channels whereby like our portfolio companies can be in touch with like our portfolio leads, our partner, as well as our CFO on a like maybe on a constant basis just to support them through these trying times. And we have seen like some of our portfolio companies who have suffered during this period, but then again, they are a resilient bunch and they have actually come back stronger. Yeah, so I see. These are all unique experience to me, by the way. Like I, even though we were in the same firm, I never knew that you have went to that extreme, to that extent where you helped portfolio companies and also meeting one of the partner in, in the early stage investment firm. I think I myself haven't had that chance, but yeah, fingers crossed. You know, I can travel there perhaps for one two months to kind of like experience. Thank you for sharing, Ryan especially the sure. next one side. But now that you've mentioned that you went back to Singapore, how different was it compared to working physically there? Perhaps you can share about like your stories on how you manage your time, your mental health. How does it affect you in terms of your work? And what do you think about being a remote venture capitalist? Yeah, sure. So for the first one, when I had to work remotely, definitely it was very new to me. You know, when I was just there for three months, I was just starting to like pick up the pace and like figure out, oh, a VC role requires me to like actively deal source. And back then deal sourcing was going out for demo days, meeting people in person, going for these events, hoping to meet a founder who who is raising and building something mm-hmm. cool. And then again, Right now, I'm halfway across the world in Singapore and about 15 to 16 hours behind them. So definitely, it was challenging. I had to rethink how I was going to source for companies right now. And also, in terms of working on the due diligence process, previously, when I was in the firm, you know, when we had DD to kind of churn out over a short time period, we actually just huddled up in a conference room together with uh, the few other associates on the team, as well as our partner at the time who will have like maybe constant, like maybe every two or three hours review on the DD. But right now, we had to kind of get innovative on it. We had to trust one another to finish our part and then we'll just meet up once to kind of go through uh, whatever that may be missing. So definitely, it was a challenging time. I, I no longer could meet founders in person and also there were no events for me to attend. And it And to a certain extent, it actually helped improve my deal sourcing capabilities because... I, I still had KPIs to meet about uh, for sourcing companies and I had to get innovative. So I went to uh, places like uh, Hacker News, Product Hunt, as well as just constantly imagining what companies do I want to start based on specific like market trends and also opportunities in the market. And I start Googling like specific keywords and hoping to like source for good companies. And to my surprise, yeah, there were quite a number of like interesting companies that popped up along the way. And definitely... In terms of mental health, I, I appreciate like the team at Scrum, you know, being like accommodating with like my schedule. So um, we usually have the calls mostly in the so morning in San Francisco. So that'll be about 12, 1 Singapore time. So that's really helpful, especially like, you know, being a uni student, you don't really sleep that early. So I'm still very sharp at that time. And I, I keep most of the deal sourcing or even just like my research work for like earlier on in the morning where I, those kind of are more passive. So it doesn't really require me to like interact with like other founders. And yeah, in terms of mental health, I think the most challenging part would be 
it can get lonely, you know, being alone in the room. Mm. And in my house, you know, the lights are all off, everyone's sleeping, and then working for a team that is halfway across the world, you have no one to talk to. And then when you're awake, when the, when in, your friends are awake in Singapore, you're actually sleeping. And most of the time, I'll sleep to about like 5 p.m. And by then, it's like dinner and then prepare for work and then work starts again. So I guess that's some of the challenges uh, with working remotely. And also, definitely the sleep cycle. So that's a big challenge because having like to sleep like a specific time for over uh, a year was something challenging. Oh, yeah. But yeah, right. somehow yeah. or rather, yeah, somehow or rather, I, I cope well. And I think one reason that I was able to cope well was because of the adrenaline rush that I get whenever I source for an interesting company and then uh, I speak with them and I think that is the kind of stuff that kind of uh, powers me through the night and I kind of forget like hey it's I'm in the middle of the night and talking to someone who is like in the middle of the day yeah I agree with you by the way I currently am working in the same like uh, time zone as for and you mentioned which is 12 a.m and until 8 a.m but I am very lucky why because the first few months, I actually have client B, so a company B, working in the same very strange time zone, uh, working across like from Singapore, and the, the whole team is all in the US. I mean, everyone is working remotely. They, no one is working from the office, but still, it feels very lonely, I guess. And I would say if you didn't expand your six months, I probably feel worse in terms of loneliness. I can, I can really understand that, you know. And yeah, but thank you for being very vulnerable in sharing your story, especially the mental health side. I also relate so much, especially with jumping on calls with founders that you think are very exceptional. And yeah, maybe you can share a bit about what do you think is the most privileged thing about being PC. And perhaps you can also share more about how is your thought process when you source deals? Yeah, sure. So for my, in terms of pri- privilege, yeah, I think the most privileged thing about being a VC is actually not being in, uh, not having the authority. Some people might have the misconception that when you're a VC, you have the authority mm-hmm. because you are the one giving money. But in reality, the most privileged thing is to actually partner with these startups who are actually going on to change the world and build something great. I think being able to work alongside them and also being able to empathize with the founder's journey. I think that is something that I really have the privilege and definitely there are exceptional founders along the way and I've met many of them who came out from uh, Ivy League schools and had past uh, experience in large tech companies like Google, Facebook, etc. And them wanting to actually heed your advice. So I, I remember there was this I spoke with back then. He, he, he was sharing with me about like a cashback product and you know I was digging in more and more about how is the user flow going to be for a B2C, a fintech company? And I think he paused after maybe my third question and then he told me, hey, you are actually a very product-centric person. And I think I appreciate this such feedback given by founders because, I mean, I myself have not been in in a startup capacity before except uh, trying to launch my own products. So I really appreciate the kind of validation that uh, these startup founders give me when I'm looking at their product and trying to analyze uh, any potential pitfalls or be leap of faith assumption or validations that has not been addressed. So I think I think that is the main privilege of being a VC, just being able to partner with these amazing founders and also just for them to give me some time of theirs to actually uh, share about their um, the product they're building. And for the second one, for deal sourcing, like what do I think of when I speak with a startup? So I think the first thing I would like to, I usually want to like get to know what this company is building is actually just a, a very simplified version of what are you doing and who is it for? You know, I, I like to follow, I, I heard this um, speech by Don Valentine previously. He was the founder of Sequoia Capital. And he said, mm. if you can't explain your business idea on the back of the name card, then it's too complicated. And that is something I will go into every call, like trying to pick out. And one reason for that is because I'll have to relay whatever information I collect to the investment team to help make sure the team who wasn't on the call get up to speed. And secondly, it sets the tone for the rest of the call. So I know exactly what am I supposed to focus on and what is the core technology or the product that the team is building. Secondly, I think I'll focus on the market. 
I know many VCs are obsessed with large market. But for me, large market is one thing. But secondly, I like to question the founders whether is there a market for it? You know, I, I like to invest in companies whereby the markets aren't so where there are intersections between adjacent markets. So uh, for an example of that would be uh, embedded finance. We have seen like in the case of like Shopify, which was actually a, just a white label e-commerce platform, moving into the fintech space yeah. with their Shopify capital, providing loans. And that is one thing that gets me excited. Does this company have the potential? They might be in a verticalized uh, industry right now, be it a SaaS solution, but do they have the ability to actually leverage uh, their technology mm-hmm. to um, expand into different uh, markets? So that is the second point I'll look at. And lastly, I'm always interested about the founder's journey. Like what made you leave a comfortable job or what made you start this uh, company? Because I always believe a founder should um, launch a product which is to a certain extent his own personal problem so that down the road when the going gets tough, he'll be able to persevere through and he'll always remember like his why. You know, I see many founders during the rise of remote work, they just went on and launched remote working tools, video conferencing tools and they just incorporated every feature that was out there. And when, when I look at such uh, products, I would say it's a cool product, but I don't think you can build a great company out of it. And the reason for that is because they don't really have a strong like why. So a case in point was Eric Yuan of Zoom. The reason why he created Zoom was because he realized the existing Cisco uh, WebEx, had, the latency wasn't as great. And he figured like he could solve this problem, which was why he moved on. And back then when he was launching it, you know, I, rem- I read a post saying like other VCs told him, hey, there are Microsoft Teams, there's Google Hangouts back then. So why do you even want to, and there is Cisco WebEx where it came from. Why do you want to like get into the space of, of like video conferencing? You know, it's so crowded. Oh, I don't think it's Microsoft Teams. I think it was Skype back then. So yeah, and, uh-huh. and funny enough, another uh, fun fact, I read one of the individual investors actually invested um, in Zoom after a football game with Eric. So the reason for that was he saw his like tenacity during the game and he was so impressed. He's like, okay, screw it. I know it's so crowded. I don't really know much about like the, the kind of like latency that you have and how is it really going to make a difference. But you know what? I'm going to back you just because I trust you as a founder. And yeah, those are some of the stuff I really want. I, I, I look at when, when I speak with the founder during the initial call. And also one thing I picked up from Don Valentine, sorry, Doug Leone from Sequoia was the ability of the founder, the language of the founder. So founders who always mention we instead of I, because as you mentioned, building a company is a team effort, not an individual effort. So I want founders who are able to empathize with their employees and also one that are, who are able to build a great culture because I believe building a great product is not enough to build an enduring company. In order to build an enduring company that will last 100 years, you need to build a great product with a great culture to withstand the, the, the test of time. Yeah, so uh, yeah, those are the three main things I look out when I'm sourcing for companies. I see. So the three mainly is product, market, and founder. You mentioned about the wives of the founder. So this is not a pre-recorded plan, but actually I'm currently reading this book. Simon Sinek. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have, have you read the book? I was like, the, the moment you, you said like, oh yeah, I wanted to find founders that always know their wives. Then I saw, I saw my book here, you know. <laughs> wow, uh, what a coincidence. Yeah, but, but I, guess, yeah. I guess what you mentioned is very true in the sense that even Eric Yen, by the time that he created Zoom, who would have thought that there would be such a pandemic, you know? He wouldn't know that there would be COVID. I personally don't think that Zoom was uh, Zoom was that huge. I mean, before pandemic, it was. It has great traction, I think, but it was not that huge. It was. It has not taken off yet. And yeah, sometimes it's just that the founder is the one who made the difference. You can have like the same product. You can have the same uh, market opportunity, perhaps. But if you don't have that kind of, if you don't have that kind of founder, or that kind of leader that can lead the ship to the correct place, to the correct direction. I think it's very tough. So yeah, thanks for giving all these uh, insights from yourself. Maybe you can also share, perhaps, you mentioned about how embedded finance can be the future. It makes you excited since 
there is a combination of two markets, two adjacent verticals, two industries. What exactly in embedded life and do you think would be the future? Sure. Yeah, I was very fortunate during my time at Scrum. I was given the opportunity to like focus on some verticals that I was really passionate about, like fintech. So while working on fintech, I actually uh, looked into the embedded finance space. And one reason that it got me excited was well, there's this piece written by Anderson Horowitz, whereby they say every company is a fintech company. And I think the next piece, if they are going to launch another, would be why every company will require embedded finance to kind of accomplish this vision of theirs. Because the beauty of embedded finance is, as the, as the name goes, the ability to embed financial products by using a simple API. So existing software companies who actually have maybe like, for example, SaaS companies who actually have high user retention, but also low average revenue per user, they can leverage on these uh, embedded financial companies to offer financial products and kind of increase the average revenue per user and also their margin in the long run. So in terms of embedded finance, you know, there are like a large range of industries going from like embedded payments, whereby we've seen in like Uber and Lyft, whereby like payments can be done like directly in app. Then we have the embedded lending space, like Klarna and Afterpay and Affirm in the US, which is huge. And then in Southeast Asia, we have um, Atom. And then also uh, in terms of like embedded investments, you know, I saw like Acons uh, have the ability to like embed this kind of like spare change rounding up feature onto other platforms. And we see that with in Southeast Asia with these super apps who are, such as Grab and Shopee who are actually launching their own financial product. So for Grab, they are launching, of course, they have partnered with insurance firms to launch their uh, Grab Insure. Also, they have launched their own Grab Invest. And then for Shopee, they have launched their mm -hmm. own payments in the form of Shopee Pay. So definitely, I, I view the one of the key trends in fintech would be uh, embedded finance simply because they'll be able to increase the um, overall market size that they are currently in. And also the uh, lifetime value of each customer, they can increase from like two to five X compared to their existing like uh, subscription model and also unlock new verticals, which previously had a market size that was too small and a high customer acquisition cost. So uh, for example, like SaaS based, uh, fintech business model will be one that uh, I foresee will be interesting in the near future. So for example, customers in like horizontal markets, they can focus on like different software vendors. And as a result, there may be like multiple winners in the space. And also the, these uh, customers in like vertical markets, they usually prefer uh, software for a uh, specific solution that are uh, purpose built. So in future, these um, SaaS-based companies can actually embed like financial products onto their platform and kind of increase the overall um, lifetime value. And then we'll see more VC actually backing such companies. So many a times, you know, for these SaaS companies, one of the say, challenges to investment for VC would be, is the market big enough? But if you can convince the VC that yes, the market is huge, just because of your ability to uh, embed financial products in the near term, I would say there's a huge market uh, opportunity. An example would be what a firm is doing in the US. So they started off as an e-commerce solution, if you think about it. Their main goal is just to increase conversion for these e-commerce merchants. Yeah. And right now, I think they are launching their own financial products and also the ability to underwrite these loans of their balance sheet. I think that's something that's very interesting. And they are actually using over, I think, 250 uh, data points to actually assess a consumer uh, credit worthiness compared to these traditional wow. financial institutions. And through each chase and loan they make, they can actually improve their model. So yeah, I think that's an interesting space, you know. You, you launch a product to actually solve a problem in a different vertical. And in the future, you actually can spin off more product based off your existing uh, data sets. So you mentioned about a firm in this embedded finance space and also how it's quite huge in the US. Maybe you can perhaps give the listeners a bit of what a firm is so that perhaps people are still finding out what's the next trend and they can kind of reference from what the US is doing right now. Yep. So I think a firm started in like 2011 or 2012. So they are buy now pay later solution mm -hmm. for e-commerce merchants to increase their conversion and overall GMV on the platform. So uh, what they do is they actually uh, enable merchants to accept 
an installment in a sense. So what a firm does is a firm will pay the merchants uh, upfront and they'll collect uh, these installments directly from the merchant. So a firm on their end will actually assess an individual's credit score to enable to loan them this amount. So a firm actually pays the upfront fee directly to the merchant and the mer in exchange, the merchant actually pays a small uh, transaction fee. Okay, so I'm curious. Are you actually interested in having a career in the fintech space in the future, what do you see yourself after Scrum? Yeah, so uh, definitely after being in a VC for like a year and a half, I have been able to narrow down some verticals that I'm interested in and I think I want to like pursue in uh, for a career. So I guess the two main categories will be um, fintech and as well as decentralized finance. So I also look into the DeFi space quite a bit. So yeah, in terms of next steps after VC, I, for me, I think if I were to join another VC fund in Southeast Asia, it will be because of the uh, industry focus of the firm. So the firm will probably be like a fintech focused firm who are investing in like embedded finance, DeFi, as well as banking as a service in the region. And also the next thing I'll look at uh, when looking for my next role is like the people, I believe the team is very important, especially starting on early in your career, the ability to gain mentorship from like industry experts to build up like your domain knowledge in the space. So that's some areas I'll be looking at. So some of the roles I'm looking at are either a VC role to continue investing in the, in the Southeast Asia space, which is actually growing rapidly. I will actually look to join a fintech role and kind of get my hands dirty in the operator uh, role. And I guess being able to walk the path of an entrepreneur and in the long run, definitely I, I do hope to return to the VC space in future and potentially even launch my own fund, you know. And one of the like moonshot ambitions I have would be to be on the Forbes Midas list. So the Forbes Midas list is where they rank the top 100 uh, venture capitalists of the year every year and yeah, like your investment. So yeah, definitely someday I, I would hope to see myself on that list. And the reason for being on that list is not so much of an ego thing, but I guess validation that yes, you have been able to be built or partner with a company who has actually built a meaningful product that solve a, a pain point in the world and hopefully make, make the world like a better place. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting because we haven't ever talked about this, by the way, <laughs> outside of the <laughs> podcast, but yes, I actually has that same dream, you know, because I realized, and I don't know, maybe this can relate to you as well. I realized that I have always been wanting to be the person who can impact the society, especially for me, it's Indonesia. Because of that, I wanted to create something. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, right? But now I realize that having an impact to the society can also be achieved as an investor, as someone who is from the other side of the coin. You know? And that's why I think, yeah, being in the Midas list is a huge thing, I would say. Of course, I, I would not deny myself. I think I would be proud uh, to be in that list someday. But more than that, I would say, it's knowing that you've done your job so well, such that you're investing in the companies that create real impacts to the society, which is what you mentioned previously. Yeah, it's, it's one of the top of the crop. Of the Holy Grail. Yeah. yeah. Of all these investors and that brings me to the question to have this idea to perhaps go back to the VC world but you also wanted to have that operations mindset in the in the fintech area DeFi and stuff but also you mentioned that you are currently building your own startup as well so what I wanted to understand is what is your own why so what is your purpose in having this kind of like plans or the ideas to do these three things that at first, you know, for other people might seem unrelated, right? But maybe your why is the silver lining that connects all these three aspects. So yeah, what was your why? Yeah, so I guess one thing that drives me and keeps me going every day would be my desire to make a dent on the universe you know there's this talk by steve jobs seriously he 
he mentioned how we, we grew up in a world whereby people tell us don't bump into this and that and then there's this bubble but actually he said you should go out there and try to poke holes at this like world that the world kind of like gives you and then you realize you can actually like create more meaningful things out of it and my main why would be I guess is to increase financial inclusion be like in the region or in the world so in the world there are about 2 billion individuals who are underbanked and the, and this actually um, sets them up in, at a disadvantage compared to their peers in other countries or with other background. So I guess my why would be um, to improve financial inclusion for like humanity. That's why one reason why I'm so focused on like fintech and I'm interested in the space, which is one, uh, which is why I was previously at a VC focusing on fintech and also building my own fintech startup. And the reason why financial inclusion is so important is because only through financial inclusion can us as like uh, human species actually focus on the other stuff that matters. So for example, we can focus on other areas such as reversing aging. We can focus on, I mean, like what Elon Musk is doing, a brain computer interface, trying to create like hybrid human and robots. And I mean, these, some of these stuff and also um potentially be a multi-planetary species. I know some of this stuff may seem far-fetched at the start, but the fact that through financial inclusion, we can actually harness the collective, I would say, resource of human capital across the world to kind of solve the more pressing and the more technologically uh, challenging solutions. I think it's very interesting. So I guess the first step would be like financial inclusion. And yeah, in terms of the startup I'm working on, definitely it also ties back into the VC role. I, I feel a good VC is one with the with founder's empathy, one who has walked in the path of the founder. He knows the struggle. And to be honest, you know, people always talk about the struggle and the struggle can be even a simple thing as, do you prototype on Figma or Miro first? You know, it's this small little decision oh, okay. yeah. that you have to make on a daily basis that I would, I would say, if you're not in it or you have not done it before, you, you, you might struggle with, understanding why some of the founders may, I mean, they may experience burnout and they might be slow to respond to your email. And also being the ability to provide them with uh, good advice at the different stage of their company. So I think one of the advice that I really hold close to me is one by uh, Ben Horowitz, which is being comfortable in uncomfortable situation. I think that was in one of his book. Mm -hmm. And definitely for a startup founder, that's something they face on a daily basis whether are they going to get product market fit today? Is this the end of the month? Do they have enough money to pay their staff? And how's the fundraising situation going? And if you, and personally, if I were to be an investor straight out of uh, school, I feel it's something that I will have difficulty empathizing with these uh, startup founders. And also in a VC role, the only uncomfortable decision is, is this startup going to be a unicorn? I guess that's the main pressing issue on your mind. It's not really a life or death matter, unlike this startup. So I feel the operational role, be it in a fintech startup, building my own startup, will be crucial in, in future when I'm in a VC fund and vice versa. My VC experience will be, it's also helpful. I join a fintech company or build my own company. I see, it makes sense. Now everything comes together perfectly. You mentioned a bit about decentralized finance and I think for our listeners, you can explain more about what decentralized finance is. By the way, just a bit of caveat for the listeners, right? Decentralized finance is actually a very hot space right now. And you guys must have heard of it in one way or another, but you don't realize that it's called decentralized finance. So please try and explain to us a bit about what decentralized finance is and what, why you think that it's uh, the future as well. Yeah, sure. So to explain decentralized finance, it actually just refers to the shift from traditional centralized financial system, such as our the banks that we are familiar with, to a peer-to-peer -peer finance enabled by decentralized technology that is built on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, why I'm interested in the space is because after the 2008 financial crisis, we seen the lack of trust between the um, millennials and the Gen Z towards uh, traditional financial institutions. And that's one reason that gave rise to uh, new banks and challenger banks in the region. And I think the next layer of that is, it's still a centralized system, these fintech companies. Yes, they have tried to democratize it and they, have, they tried to kind of reduce the, the, 
the curtain behind banks and kind of reduce all these uh, overdraft fees. But it's still being controlled by a singular entity. And I feel the future of uh, finance will be one which is decentralized and relies on the collective, I would say, trust in the blockchain ecosystem to kind of validate uh, transactions. And also, um, I think why decentralized finance is interesting compared to, I mean, when people think of cryptocurrency, they just think of Bitcoins because Bitcoin is just, uh, Bitcoin was uh, built as a means of, or as an alternative form of payment. Whereas for decentralized finance, it's built on top of the Ethereum uh, blockchain, which is actually, as Gary Tan mentioned previously, it's um, programmable money. So on top of the Ethereum blockchain, you can launch different financial products from lending, investment to insurance. And then you realize the amount of the yield you can earn just based off decentralized finance is higher than traditional finance. And the reason behind it is because most of these lending protocols, interest rate are actually algor algorithmically defined. So there isn't really the middlemen, which are banks who will actually take the bulk of the fees. And it's actually redistributing wealth from the lender to the borrower. Yeah, I guess it's very interesting that many people actually know how to trade NFTs and how to trade cryptocurrencies. But the beauty of decentralized finance is going behind the scenes, right? Like it's going with the Ethereum protocols and all that. And I'm not in any way expert in this space, <laughs> in the decentralized finance. So thank you for explaining a bit about DeFi. And perhaps... Do you have any insights or any thoughts about where else the DeFi can go? Yeah, so I would say right now the DeFi is heavily centered around yield. So most of the individuals who go into the DeFi space, they are just focused on achieving the greatest yield. And the newest project that launched, they always have, I would say they try to match the yield and they can have triple digit yield just to kind of uh, incentivize user. So we are seeing a challenge in terms of these existing lending protocols that offer this yield, yeah, which are variable and it could actually change any time across the day. We are seeing a shift in this to uh, from these traditional lending protocols to aggregators. So aggregators are the layer on top of these existing lending protocols. So these aggregators actually use algorithm to identify which lending protocol gives the highest yield and try to help uh, users to uh, optimize their mm -hmm portfolio. And uh, beyond that, I think what, one thing that excites me about like decentralized finance is also, I would say decentralizing the creator economy. You know, creator economy has been huge in uh, the recent years. Yeah. We saw from uh, just yes. from moving away from like social media into like content creation or like Substack or even like other social media like TikTok. And the ability to decentralize these, decentralize these social media platforms for these creators is key because we have seen in instances whereby there are talks about certain individuals or with differing or maybe political viewpoints being censored by traditional big tech algorithm. And also the challenges with these big tech companies with censorship, for example, banning individuals who does not fit into their specific like ideals or viewpoints. The ability to decentralize um, these are uh, the creator economy is key. So we have seen that in the form of artists whereby they can launch their own uh, digital artwork on NFT marketplaces such as uh, OpenSeas and Rarible. And also not only to sell it, but also they could earn a percent a, a royalty fee on top of that throughout uh, every future purchase that is made. And beyond that, we have seen the rise of, I would say, decentralized social media sites that allow users to actually create their own token and also uh, create content and their value will actually uh, appreciate or depreciate based off the perceived consensus by the community. Yeah, what you mentioned is actually, yeah, I, I never thought about that, but I think it makes perfect sense. And at the end of the day, that means that the concept of decentralization doesn't only end in finance, but also go beyond the right, we can talk over and over about all this stuff, you know, it's been very great of a pleasure to have you here, Ryan. So perhaps this is a question that I always ask to all of our guests. 
what is the future for you like as a person what do you uh, want to see from the world and also for you yourself maybe 20 30 years down the road besides being in the meetups list fingers crossed I, I wanted to see you there but besides that like maybe not only in the career area but also to the personal area so I guess if I can condense the question it would be first of all for you yourself how do you see yourself maybe 20 30 years down the road besides maybe VC and also uh, besides career and then second one would be what's your advice to people who just started out venturing to the career side to the startup scene yeah so what I see myself in 20, 30 years, I think hopefully I would have gained enough experience to actually work with like the next uh, generation of entrepreneurs to kind of build our future, the future of like humanity across different verticals. And I mean, personally, I would hope to be able to get a ticket on board, be it Blue Origin or SpaceX or Virgin Galactic. Ah, it's like, okay. yeah, that's one of my, yeah, kind of like my hobby. Yeah, so I, I guess just being able to work with like future founders and throughout my career building up like enough credentials as someone who they can trust and also someone who can help them and guide them to like launch great companies hopefully and the the advice i would have for someone who is starting out i would say is i would say it's probably the same advice i gave you so you never you'll never be too ready to start a company you know you always try to convince yourself you're going to get like enough experience through i don't know various Jobs and then you always feel like you're lacking in the skill set. But I guess take the leap of faith. And if there's something that you strongly believe in, take a shot at it, especially when you're young. Or even if you're not, I believe you should be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation and be willing to accept this risk in pursuit of like your goal instead of living a life with uh, regrets. And FC Strop says, uh, try, yeah, try to poke holes in this uh, universe and this bubble that you're in and you might actually find that actually you can actually make a difference in the world. I hope the best for whatever you are currently pursuing, either it's your startup, it's your venture capital, or maybe you are going to the operational side. I hope for the best. And yeah, I really, uh, I, I hope that God will lead you wherever you go. So that's about it for the listeners. Thank you for staying up until now. See you in the next episode of PC Missy Podcast.